Hey guys, Freddy here. Welcome back to another Retro Adventures. And this is part of the series where I'm going back and looking at adventures from the very early years of role-playing. To see how writing adventures evolved from the very basic form of the early ones to what I would consider a lot more advanced and useful today. But it was a learning process. And we're going to do that this time by looking at this. Dungeon Module G2, The Glacial Rift of the Frost Giant Jarl which came out from TSR in 1978, and is written by Gary Gygax, his third published adventure. And there's a few things which are fairly obvious straight off. Firstly, we've got this cover splash on here. Um, official D&D tournament module, used at Origin 78. Now, Gary Gygax didn't believe that people would be interested in buying campaign settings and adventures, because he thought we'd all be having too much fun writing them ourselves. But with the benefit of hindsight, we can see that... It's such a time saver. Not only do you get nice boxed adventures where you get lots of feelies maps to hand out in Shadow and Adventures, you get newspaper clippings, etc. Lots of clues and things to give to players, which would take you quite a while to prepare yourself. But it's also a time saver in writing an adventure. It's a lot easier to sit down and read through a book and be ready to GM rather than spending ages creating clues and hints and riddles and everything that you need to do in an adventure, mapping out dungeons. Such a time saver, and people are willing to pay for things to save their time. So it's fairly obvious now that people will be interested in buying adventures. But he was fighting against it, and this cover splash to me is a clue that... He was still trying to stick to the idea that the only reason people would be buying adventures is when they're running it in tournaments, so people are campaigning against one another, at, or competing against one another, and you want to compare them against the same module, no matter where they're playing. But I think people will have had loads of fun with this. Now this is the second part of the Against the Giants um, campaign book, or which was sold together. Um... I've already covered the first part, which is G1, uh, Steading of the Hill Giant Chief. And it's fairly obvious from reading through that these were written all at the same time, because they flow together far more than just a series of connected adventures. These are really parts of a much larger story. And it's so obvious that they were designed that way. So this is probably going to be a bit of a shorter video because I've covered a lot of ground in it already, because the writing style in this is very, very similar to the Steading of the Hill Giant Chief. But let's dungeon, well, let's delve into it, if I can avoid tripping over my tongue. So, a repeat of the cover page. Now this is much shorter, this is only 12 pages, it's incredibly short. And the fact that we've got the cover, a repeat of the cover, and the back cover, you know, we're talking about only nine pages here. But anyway, We've got background. Some dozens of leagues to the north and west of the Steading and the Hill Giant Chief. Amidst the tallest high uh, mountain peaks is the stronghold of Grugnir, Lord of the Frost Giants. And it talks about how um, it is assumed the party has either followed a map obtained at the Steading or used the magical chain found there to arrive at the neighbourhood of the Glacial Rift. And then we've got a few paragraphs explaining them arriving on the glacier. And how difficult it is. You know, movement through this howling maze of cold is reduced to 50% of normal. Um, people can fall and take damage. But it doesn't flesh out too much. They're not really questing here. It's just an elongated encounter before they actually get into the glacial rift itself. We've got no uh, notes for the dungeon master. Again, pointing out there's considerable information contained herein, which is descriptive, but doesn't mean that you must stick to it. Um, again, Gary Gygax very much fighting against the idea that he's stepping on other people's creativity. He really didn't seem to like that at the start at all. Um, got a description in the upper areas, the giant's bag contents, because instead of having the equipment or treasure in each room described we've got random tables and we roll on those each time one of these bags from the giants is found uh, we've got wandering monsters and then the encounter areas 
So, if, for example, guard room, ice cavern, four frost giants lair in this place at all times to prevent any authorized, unauthorized use of the south passage. If any combat is going against them, one of their number will flee down this passage to give the warning of intruders to the guards at nine and ten. There are four piles of hides, four giant sacks, a pile of rocks, and ice chunks for hurling. The guards will certainly hurl missiles if they are not immediately meleeed. Their treasure is at six. See also two hereafter. And that's the kind of descriptions we're getting. Whereas it's not a block of text to read out to players, which is being incredibly descriptive. It is telling the Games Master what's in this room, what's its purpose, and what the monsters are. Which is a leap ahead of what had come before. But it's still not the blocks of text that we're used to, which describe everything. Anyway, we've got other areas. We've got another guard room, empty ice cave, ice caverns. Yeah. Guard, cavern guard complex, cave of bones, so on and so forth. Misty ice caves, the barracks one with um, 16 to 19. Four frost giants, four frost giants, six giant, uh, frost giants, and four frost giants. So lots of barracks with lots of frost giants to fight. Um, a visitor's cave, another visitor's cave with five frost giants in it. A winter wolf pack. Uh, Snow-covered dome of ice. Um, this formation has been caused by the creature that lays inside, a rimoras, 30 feet long. And then we'll get key to the lower areas and the Jarl's caverns. So we've got frost giants wandering around, the wandering monsters, encounter areas, you know, a vaulted cavern, storage cave, deserted cavern, um, emissaries cavern, prison cavern. Just lots of caverns with lots of frost giants to fight. Um, but we've got guard area, two frost giants. Kitchen get cave complex, three fire giantesses. Um, weapons cave. Here are stored 62 throwing rocks, 16 shields, 29 spears, 10 clubs, and 10, 9 helmets. All of frost giant size. So we're starting to see the interweaving of the different types of giants, because the giants are all working together. As it turns out, as you continue into the next block of uh, adventures, uh, Vault of the Drow, um, under direction of the Dark Elves. Um, Cavern of the Carls. Um, I think they mean Jarls, but Jarls Anti Cavern and Trophy Hall, Jarls Private Cavern. Um, and in this, you find the map which leads you on to the third adventure. But this is very, very basic. We're just fighting our way through. There's lots of giants, there's lots of monsters. But there's not the tactical planning that there was in Steading and the Hill Giant Chief, where you could try and burn down the wooden steading to lure the giants out or force them into other areas. This is just a standard dungeon quest. There's not a lot of imagination here at all. This ends the expedition to the glacial rift of the Jarl. And we've got a map, then you know, a large main chamber with lots of antechambers off it. And the next level, which is smaller chambers spread around. So you'll be coming down through the single entrance and f fighting your way through it. And again, once again, on the back page, we've got a picture of the Glacial Rift and various products, you know, uh, geomorphs, uh, outdoor geomorphs, and the dungeon modules. So Steading of the Hill Giant Chief, Glacial Rift of the Frost Giant Yarl, Hall of the Fine Giant King, then Descent into the Depths of the Earth, Shrine of the Kuatoa, and Vault of the Drow. So those are the two very famous books um, against the giants and Vault of the Drow, but here they are all coming out at the same time as this big interwoven tale, all written at the same time. Now, as I said, the writing standard is not where we would be today, but it is a massive leap ahead of everything that came before. This is definitely the high point of what I've been looking at, Whereas when we looked at Palace of the Vampire Queen and Temple of the Frog, we saw the standard start very basic, then go up. But then when we reached Gary Gygax's first adventure, um, whose name I forget at the moment, but I covered in a previous video, the writing standard went back down to basically Palace of the Vampire Queen. The standard dropped vastly, whereas Dave Arneson in Temple of the Frog had improved things. But Gary Gygax has definitely learned from that. And these standalone adventures that he's writing are massively better than anything that went before. Dave Arneson described rooms by their purpose, 
which was very, very useful. You know, there's nine guards here and they patrol the uh, town square every hour on the hour. But he didn't really list what was in it. Whereas Gary Kagax is listing the purpose of the room, the monsters which are in it, and all the little things that you find in it as well. And the dungeon master can build that up. So they go in and there's a table and chairs and some giants sitting warming themselves around a fire or whatever. There's not a description pre-written, but there's so much information for the game master to work from from there. But anyway, I think I've been wittering on for quite long enough. So thank you very much for watching. But as always, most of all, you look after yourselves. And I'll catch you later. Bye now. Thank you.